Since 1887, the Stonington Free Library has been a center for knowledge, ideas, creativity, and entertainment. It is a comfortable and welcoming community space for the town of Stonington, Connecticut, where all ages can explore, discover, gather and learn within a building of distinctive and unique architecture. This video program is an evolution to expand the offerings of the library to share directly in your home or organization. Welcome to the Thoughtful Thursdays speaker series made available to you by the Stonington Free Library. So I'm Michaela Hall, Assistant Director of the Library. I want to thank you all for attending the program tonight and also thank those that put in a lot of hard work to make this happen, especially Belinda Decay, the Library Director, and of course, Gail McDonald and Lee Howard. Um, all participants, as I've been saying, please keep your videos off and your mics muted unless asked by myself, Gail, or Lee to turn them on. This will just help ensure there's no sound interference or lag during the presentation. Um, we have a, a full house tonight. Um, if you have any questions throughout the meeting, please type them in the chat. All questions will be answered when we're ready to open up Q&A. I am recording the program. Uh, all personal information, such as names of participants, will be edited out before we upload it to our YouTube channel. Thank you again for attending tonight, and I will turn it over to Library Director Belinda Decay to get us started. Thank you, Michaela, for being our host and running our Zoom program so beautifully. It's no easy task, and she's very skillful at it. And welcome to everyone who's joined us this afternoon for another of Stonington Free Library's Thoughtful Thursday programs. It's the second of three linked programs, um, which is kind of not, nothing we expected to happen that grew out of the one we had last month on Frederick Douglass in New London, based on research by Tom Shook. And Tom is returning on Thursday, October 15th, to present the third program in this series, which touches on systemic racism as it figures in our own local history. Tom will be discussing the Negro Motorist Green Book. As Tom says, this was more than a simple travel guide. It was a survival guide for black travelers, and it has now become a history book, a read between the lines chronicle of mid 20th century life for both black and white, North and South, including New London and Stonington in Jim Crow America. Tom will also be talking about the Orchard House, a green book listing that was on Route 1 in Stonington across from Stonington High School and also some new information he has about New London. So if you put that on your calendars and watch out um, for our posting on it and the registration information. So yeah. and now um, it is my greatest pleasure that I welcome our distinguished speaker for this evening, Gail McDonald, and our moderator, um, he turned out to be moderator at all three programs, Lee Howard. <laughs> Gail is a professor in residence in the journalism department at the University of Connecticut Stores and a veteran journalist with a deep love for local history. She is a former reporter for the day and was a regular contributor to the New York Times, the Hartford Current and Rhode Island Monthly Magazine. She has won numerous awards for her journalism. But this, um, she's also presented her first book at the library um, some a couple of years ago, I think. So she's she's welcome. We welcome her back again, and her book, Hid, "The Hidden History of Mystic and Stonington," was released in March this year, and it's her second book. She's a former longtime resident of Porkatuck and currently lives with her husband in New London. So we're very glad to welcome you, Gail. And thank you. As um, the moderator, as I said, is again Lee Howard. Lee Howard is the New London Days community editor and currently runs um, the Times Weekly Newspapers, which I gather has increased in numbers since we last talked. So Lee's going to just say something about that. Um, he's a graduate of Washington and Lee University, and over his 40-year career in journalism, he's received 
many awards, in particular the prestigious Theodore Driscoll Award for Investigative Reporting from the Connecticut Society of Professional Journalists. In 2008, he received a fellowship from the National Press Foundation in Washington, DC. And that is just two on a very long list. He served in every department of the day newspaper, is an avid tennis player, youth basketball coach, and volunteers for the Special Olympics. So we're very honored to have you back, Lee. And um, I also, before I let you speak, I also want to add that he's a passionate supporter of libraries, which is, I think, why we're here today, and has a wonderful understanding of their value in the life of any community and their role in sustaining democracy. Which is my segue into saying that the same applies to our local newspapers, how vital they are and how we need to support them. Because I saw looking through Gail's book, reading Gail's book, but looking through the bibliography, how much information was supplied by old records from our local newspapers. These guardians of our collective community memory cannot be valued too highly or protected too much. So Lee, I don't know um, if you just want to add something to, to that. Wow, it's not much to add. Thank you, Belinda. Um, we're very honored to be here today and to uh, represent, you know, exactly the voices of people today that are making history um, that 100 years from now we'll be reading about, um, God willing. So we hope uh, if we don't keep the physical newspapers going, at least we keep the reporting and storytelling going uh, that we are doing now in some form or another. And we're expanding that. We're doing podcasts, we're doing videos. I mean, there's a lot of different ways of telling stories and we're trying to get into all that now. Uh, the most exciting thing from my point of view is just a couple weeks ago, uh, the day announced that we're gonna be launching a new weekly newspaper in Norwich, Connecticut with a circulation of 28,000. So how many new newspapers are happening in the world today? Very few, and to have a 28,000 circulation paper covering not only Norwich, but Griswold and Sprague and Voluntown and a bunch of uh, different places up in the Northern Territory. That puts the Times papers at about 105,000 circulation, which is actually a little bit bigger than the Hartford Current. So <laughs> that's a, a really amazing thing. Uh, and we'll be launching on October 1st. So anyone who's listening, I hope you, if you live in Norwich or you have uh, people who live in Norwich, spread the word, uh, send me some story ideas, uh, send me some stories, um, write some history, uh, whatever you want to do. We're, uh, one thing about the Times Papers is we, we really do open it up to everyday people to get involved in, in writing and helping us uh, to put out the paper. So, uh, but of course our main reason to be here today is to uh, honor Gail McDonald's uh, new book on the hidden history of Mystic and Stonington. So I wanna turn to Gail and say thank you for being part of this. And I just wanted to start out by asking uh, what it's like to write a history book and, and why hidden history? And what does that even mean? Thanks Lee. Um, well, the, the category hidden history was uh, dictated by the publisher. Uh, they have a series of books called hidden history of various places. And, uh, but it was up to me to define how that was uh, going to look for Mystic and Stonington. And I've always been really hit, uh, interested in trying to um, present a much broader view of history. Uh, we, we tend to learn in, in uh, school, uh, at I mean, at, when I was in school, um, at least, uh, about um, the wealthy, uh, the white, <laughs> the males. Um, and so I knew that I wanted to have this uh, book focus, for the most part, on uh, women, Native Americans, um, African Americans, and um, uh, some other people, uh, not so rich, um, immigrants, and, and those kinds of folks. Okay. So in your mind, why don't we know more about this history, particularly revolving around Blacks, Native Americans, and immigrants? So what makes it so difficult to dig up this history, and where did you find sources? 
Well, as, um, as Belinda uh, mentioned, I, I do rely an awful lot on uh, newspaper accounts for, uh, for my research, but I uh, spent a lot of time at the Stonington Historical Society, uh, at um, the Indian Colonial Research Center in Old Mystic, at the Mystic River Historical Society, and uh, in talking with people Unfortunately, a lot of the history that I did want to focus on um, was hard to find because the um, media, the, the uh, legacy press, if you will, uh, tended to ignore um, people unless they were people of authority, um, wealthier folks. I mean, the immigrant communities were not covered at all. And uh, because I was on a pretty tight deadline to produce the book, um, probably the best source that I could have gotten would have been through uh, interviews of, of, of descendants of people, um, but I just did not un have the time to do that. Um, I found bits and pieces of things. Uh, there were pieces of black history up at the Connecticut Hist uh, Historical Society in Hartford that were very helpful, for example, but it was up to me to flesh a lot of this out with context, and um, and that was the difficult part. Well, I imagine a lot of folks back then maybe weren't as literate as they are today, and so a lot of it may have been passed around, as you said, in oral history that may be difficult to come by unless you were able to reach the right people. Yeah, and um, you know, let's face it: the folks who kept journals and uh, and spent uh, uh, had a lot of leisure time to spend uh, doing writing and sort of uh, contemplating life. Uh, that's uh, were not the people that are primarily focused in my book. A lot of these folks were focused on survival, and so they, even if they were literate, which, as you point out, many of them weren't, um, they just weren't spending their time uh, writing diaries. Right, okay. And you told me something interesting about some of the uh, information you uh, received uh, came from shipping manifests and uh, the people that were listed on them. Uh, so I guess uh, the lists were really uh, revelatory for you and apparently anyone with darker skin was listed as black. So who, who did that encompass back then? Yeah, they were uh, the sailors were often categorized um, as by by race um, or ethnicity, and sometimes it was pretty sketchy. So often they would just list anybody with a darker skin as black, and that could include um, Native Americans. Many of the uh, Pequots served as whale whalemen, for example. Uh, could include Portuguese, um, sort of anybody who had a darker skin might be thrown into that category. Sometimes they did distinguish between uh, what they called mulatto, um, which would be somebody of mixed race perhaps, but it was, uh, a lot of it was recorded based on somebody looking at somebody and, and making a judgment about them. Okay. And you told me uh, about a few things that have come up since you wrote the book. For instance, uh, thanks to my talk last month with Tom Shook, you've tracked down the picture of the Orchard House. Uh, tell me a little bit about the inn and how you finally found the painting of it. Sure, um, I'm going to actually, uh, uh, I'll try to share my screen so that, um, so that I can um, show you a picture of the old or orchard house and where, where uh, was the orchard house yeah yeah so let me uh, let me talk about that a little bit and then i i want to thank tom shook for actually sharing this photo with me uh of a painting uh the orchard house was a a lodging house a sort of bed and breakfast inn that was run by two sisters uh the carter sisters in the um, in the mid 20th century, it was located on Route One, uh, right across from where Stonington High School is now, and um, uh, beside where the current uh, near where the current police station is. And the two pillars, stone pillars that you can see in this painting, are actually all that's left there. Everything else has been demolished. 
um, but it was a uh, it was a very interesting story. The Carter uh, sisters were black. Um, they had uh, come from New York. Uh, they had worked in New York, and um, they knew that there was uh, a demand for um, safe lodging and um, and uh, good restaurants for the traveling uh, black families, middle class, uh, many of whom were coming from New York City and, and other places, uh, more urban places. Um, but this was a time when there was de facto segregation, even in the North. And um, they, they started an inn up on uh, Liberty Street or Route 2 in Pawkatuck. And then they bought what was then called the White House Inn from um, another owner who, who uh, and this is a picture of that place. Um, and that's where they ran the inn for, for most of the time. It was, um, it was demolished in 1970. And uh, thanks to Tom, I was, uh, I was able to get this picture and I asked him if I could share it tonight. And I know he'll talk a lot more about the inn next month, but uh, actually, <laughs> This, this uh, painting is in a building that is right there on the site of where this inn used to sit, not the police station, but it's um, the high-tech profiles building that many, uh, many of you will, will, will recognize that name. Um, I actually knew that it was there and I had um, asked the owner of the building if I could go in and take a picture of it. He never got back to me when I was doing my research, but I should have done what Tom did and just walked into the building and taken the picture. There you go. Okay. Well, you also told me a crazy story about a black couple whose parents lived in Stonington who ended up meeting the Tsar of Russia. And you had a descendant actually contact you after the book came out to tell you a little bit more. So, so tell me that story. Yeah, sure. The, the story was about a couple named Claude Gabriel and Prudence Jenkins Gabriel. And uh, Prudence's mother and father were actually enslaved people uh, uh, in Stonington. And uh, her mother was named uh, Phyllis uh, Brown, and she uh, was uh, enslaved by Captain Peleg Brown in Stonington. And um, her father uh, was named Piero Hallam, and uh, he was uh, owned by two different people, uh, one named Thomas Noyes and one named uh, John Hallam. Um, often the owners of enslaved people would give their slaves their last name, or they would impose that name on them. Um, Prudence, the daughter, was born a, a free person, and this was in the early 19th century. She uh, worked for um, very high, high up society in uh, the state of Rhode Island. She worked for um, governors uh, there and uh, as as servants, and her husband Claude, who was um, a Haitian and uh, came to the U.S. shortly after the Haitian Revolution. Uh, he he was uh, brought to to Russia at one point, and uh, he caught the eye of the Russian Tsar, who uh, asked that he stay there and work for the Tsar. Um, he did, but he wanted to bring his wife and children over. And so he enlisted um, help that included uh, John Quincy Adams uh, to help bring uh, uh, Prudence and the children over. Um, the story that I found in the Stonington Historical Society was actually about uh, Prudence and Claude's visit to her parents uh, just before they shipped out to Russia. And after the book came out, I was contacted by uh, descendants of theirs um, who have uh, done a lot of research, um, but it's kind of sad because a lot of their, um, the, what they know about their ancestors 
was told from the point of view of the famous white people for whom they worked. So very little of the actual um, documents that they have are told by um, their ancestors themselves. And uh, it just points out another difficulty of trying to dig up um, a lot of this uh, history because it, it often was told from the point of view of, of the white, wealthier, um, and sometimes owners of uh, the black people. Okay. But you have dug up the fact there was a, a fairly a good sized black community in Stonington Borough at, at one point uh, that seemed to also have sort of precipitously disappeared. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about what that era was, how you think they came to be located here and, and what do you think happened to them? Sure, uh, actually I wish I spent an inordinate amount of time trying to find out what happened to them. Uh, and I never have really pinpointed that. Uh, I suspect that they moved out of the borough at some point to find work, but they came there in the uh, mid 19th century when um, the borough was, and I'll just show a picture of this. Um, When the borough was actually a, uh, a center of um, a big steamship depot and a railroad depot. So the railroad was uh, in 1837 came to Stonington. And so uh, people would ride the steamships from New York, uh, land in Stonington, and then uh, get on the train at some point uh, to head further north up to say Providence or Boston or wherever they were going. Uh, so, so Stonington, which is now, you know, very quiet, very um, uh, demure kind of village was a, um, a real bustling industrial center. And a lot of the, uh, a certain number of, of black people came to, to Stonington to work both for the railroad and on the steamships. So they worked as porters and uh, they worked in construction and, um, and various jobs. Uh, some of them worked um, in the hotel that we're gonna talk about a little bit later that also was developed in conjunction with the railroad. And the steamship line um, sort of ceased operation around the turn of the 20th century. And so that's when that community drifted away. And um, again, I, I really, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what happened to them and also more of what their life was like when they w lived in the borough. Um, but it was, they were a sizable, community that remained pretty well invisible. Okay, but as far as you can tell, it was sort of a natural uh, withering away of the population as opposed to anything more sinister. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to say, it really is hard to say. There's no doubt in my mind that um, there was, that they endured um, a certain amount of prejudice and bigotry directed at them and whether that played into their decisions to move along, um, I don't know. I did not find specific evidence um, saying yes or no to that, but I did find a lot of little hidden kind of innuendos and stories that certainly illustrated what um, the, um, the 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 sort of conventional wisdom was about how um, people should be treated, and you know it wasn't good. I mean, people black the black black people were not treated well, even by people who were fighting for for their rights. Sometimes, I mean, one of the most this is getting a little bit off topic, but. One of the most sort of astounding things I, I discovered um, both in this history and in some others that I've done is that even people who are abolitionists, who we 
tend to think of as being very nice people um, did not believe in racial equality necessarily. Many, many of them wanted the, to pack blacks onto a ship and send them uh, to Africa. Right, right. So, uh, and, and related to that, Stonington once had a black church, a black school, the Orchard House Summer Inn that catered to blacks. Uh, so I assume there's some sort of history of segregation in town based on that? Well, the, uh, the history there kind of um, paralleled a lot of other places. Uh, early on in the early 1800s, when there were uh, kind of a fewer number of, of Blacks in the community, and many of them were still enslaved, um, there is some evidence that actually Black children attended school with white children in Stonington, for example. But uh, around the middle of the 19th century, there were some incidents, including Nat Turner's um, uprising, a slave uprising, when, um, when white people started to get quite nervous about this and the talk of abolition and uh, the number, increasing numbers of uh, members of the black community uh, led to some uh, segregation. So, for example, I do have a picture here of the um, the black church that was in the in the borough, and um, and this this was it. It was located not far from where the where the library currently is, um, kind of across the street. And this uh, church was built by uh, the black community. It was the uh, uh, Third Baptist Church. It was called. And in all the records that I uh, found of the uh, of that church, um, and it was pretty detailed. One of the few things that was pretty detailed about the black community, they never came out and said, you know, hey, we were treated terribly in the Baptist church, so we want our own church. Um, but the uh, reading between the lines, it was pretty evident that uh, uh, that was. That was why they left and, and set up their own church. I know that blacks were made to sit in the balconies uh, of the churches or in the back, uh, separate from the white uh, churchgoers. So it was natural that they wanted their own church. Okay. And uh, moving on to a different type of community, the fishing community, where many people were of Portuguese descent. Uh, when did they start coming into the borough and, and what's what's happened to them? Sure, uh, so that's a really uh, interesting uh, group and and I think that many people in Stonington know a lot more about the Portuguese um, immigrants and uh, and their descendants because um, because they're still there <laughs> and they're not in the borough necessarily, but they, uh, many of them are still uh, among the fishing community there. Uh, the first Portuguese uh, immigrant came to Stonington around 1824, which was uh, pretty early, but uh, that person was actually a farmer. Uh, he came from the Azores. And then by the mid 1800s, there were uh, many more people of uh, Portuguese that just uh, were coming into the borough and they were coming as fishermen. Um, a lot of the boats actually, uh, especially uh, whale boats, were, when they were out, it was, so, it was such a terrible job and life aboard these ships was, was not great. So often the ships would leave their home ports uh, without a full contingency of seamen and uh, they would stop in various places and um, through means that uh, were both um, uh, above board and uh, not so above board, they would uh, get more crewmen that way. So they would frequently stop in the Azores and pick up crew, crew members there and many of them ended up coming back to Stonington. Are you saying the, the crew members were sometimes kidnapped from their native land? <laughs> <laughs> uh, they were coerced in various coerced. ways. They were sometimes promised things that did not materialize. Um, I think that um, there is some evidence that, the, that it came pretty close to kidnapping sometimes, yeah. Okay. 
Um, and of course, there's a big fishing tradition in Stonington anyway, but uh, I guess there was something that specifically happened to some of the fishermen during Prohibition uh, that you, you mentioned in your book. Yeah, that was a, a really fun story that I found. Um, there was a, a lot written in the newspapers about prohibition, so so that was one uh, thing that I was able to to uh, dig up from newspaper accounts, and uh, it was mostly because the most people did not really agree with prohibition, so uh, there was a lot of sympathy for people who were uh, running rum and and bootlegging. <laughs> And uh, during the uh, early years of the Great Depression, when the fishermen were really suffering economically like everybody else, uh, some of them did uh, kind of take up boot bootlegging as a substitute um, profession. But there was one instance where um, a, uh, a big uh, bootlegging boat uh, had to dump uh, a whole load of booze out in uh, Stonington Harbor uh, because they were being chased by the Coast Guard, and so they dumped it. And uh, for days, apparently, all the fishermen were going out and uh, casting their nets and filling up uh, bottles of booze. And there was, um, they were selling it for a, a pretty tidy sum. <laughs> okay, uh, just switching gears a little bit. Tell me a little bit about this character you have in your book by the name of Charles Q. Eldridge. He was kind of a P.T. Barnum character from Old Mystic in the early part of the last century. Yeah, Charles Q. Eldridge was, uh, um, I'll try to share my screen again. Um, so I have a picture of him here. Uh, Charles Q. Eldridge, I, I actually um, wondered about whether I should put him in um, because he has been written about by local historians quite a bit. Uh, but he was such an interesting character, I just couldn't leave him out. And here's a picture of what his um, little museum looked like. It was on, uh, it was up in Old Mystic on the Mystic River. And he uh, was born in Old Mystic or around 1845, uh, but he left when he was quite young and uh, he made a, his, um, kind of fortune in uh, the lumber industry. And then at some point he came back to, uh, to Old Mystic and he um, had traveled extensively. And so he collected stuff from everywhere and he decided to put it all together in his house and he opened it um, as a museum. Um, he claimed that uh, he had uh, thousands of visitors a year there, uh, which probably was accurate, but uh, he apparently was, uh, was quite the character, loved telling stories. Um, some of them were true and many of them were apocryphal, um, but uh, he opened his museum in 1917. Um, but around 1929, uh, the museum that would uh, become Mystic Seaport opened and uh, his little uh, kind of carnival show uh, lo uh, lost a lot of uh, interest and he died in 1937 and, and everything was was sold off. Okay, kind of a cool character. So, uh, but you know, for the most part, you focus uh, more on uh, people that aren't as well known, including uh, quite a few women. Uh, who broke the mold, including Mary Job Akeley, an adventurer in the 20th century, who uh, is in the Connecticut Women's Hall of Fame, so she's certainly known, but uh, she actually established the first girls camp in Mystic on River Road. Um, so tell me a little bit about her and why you found her interesting. So Mary Job was actually uh, another person that I had um, some some second thoughts about whether to include her in the book because she is is not hidden per se. A lot of people certainly knew about her and knew about her achievements. Um, and uh, she did get some amount of, um, of uh, recognition in her lifetime. Um, so, uh, but she was just my favorite person and I, I had to include her in the book. Um, she, she um, was, I think the thing that struck me the most about her was that in her lifetime, she was married, here, here she is, 
Um, she was married for only two years. Um, she married um, a, another uh, naturalist and explorer named Carl Akeley. And so they were only married, he was a lot older than her, and uh, he died just two years into the marriage. Uh, but what um, annoyed me was that ever after she was referred to uh, in the terms of her husband as Carl Akeley's widow or um, you know, her carrying on Carl Akeley's um, work. When indeed, as early as 1905, she was trekking through the Canadian wilderness, leading explorations of the Fraser River as a, as a single woman, um, it, which was just astounding. I mean, 1905, no women were doing that, or very few were doing anything other than getting married and having babies. Right. And didn't she establish the Peace Sanctuary as well? She, um, so she opened Camp Mystic in, um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot about that part. Yes, yeah, so she came to Mystic because she was looking for a place to establish a camp for girls. And in um, uh, 1916, she opened Camp Mystic and it was a summer camp um, for pretty wealthy girls, but it was a combination of girls coming from uh, New York City, Boston, uh, uh, Philadelphia, uh, other kinds of big cities, and some local girls. And uh, it was um, the land that was uh, on the Mystic River, um, north of downtown Mystic, <laughs> and she, she ran that until the Great Depression uh, pretty much put it out of business. Um, when she died, she, she willed the land, uh, and it is now the uh, Peace Sanctuary. It's known as the Peace Sanctuary. Okay. And it's going to figure in another one of your questions that is coming up. So. Oh, right, right. Okay. <laughs> uh, you also uh, sketch out the life of Mary Birch Brewster, a captain's wife. Uh, why did you find her notable? So I came across the story of, of Mary Birch Brewster, and again, she was a person who, who had been written about a little bit. There have been a couple of books that have looked at um, females who went uh, out to sea with their husbands who were whaling captains, uh, and she was from uh, Stonington. Um, so I, at the time, she uh, seemed to be the only one I could find from Stonington, female, who had gone aboard a whaling ship with her husband. Um, I later learned that uh, probably more women did this than we tend to know about. Um, and it just hasn't been sort of well documented and their stories haven't been shared as much. Uh, but still, she was only 18 when she married in 1841. And uh, she went to sea with her husband just four years later. So she was like a 22-year-old woman. And she spent um, literally years aboard a whaling ship with her husband with, you know, all, all males aboard. Um, and they would, she would see other women occasionally when they would stop in various ports and there would be um, uh, other women there in the port. Um, but for the most part, she spent um, years uh, just uh, her, she was the only woman. And I thought that was pretty astounding. Well, I guess they didn't have to build a widow's walk, right? Right. <laughs> well, she but, was at but sea. There was, um, there was evidence that her family more or less disowned her for doing this, for going out to sea. They thought that it was not proper. And uh, so the, after the first voyage, when she came back, um, apparently they weren't changing their minds about, about her, and she wasn't changing her mind about uh, wanting to be with her husband, and she shipped back out with them in very short order. Wow. Cool. Now, you mentioned in your book also uh, religious bigotry against Irish Catholics and the widespread acceptance of slavery in Stonington and elsewhere in Connecticut. Uh, did you find that surprising? Tell us some more details. 
I didn't really find it surprising. I mean, my, my husband is of um, Irish um, ancestry. And so I know from him that, you know, the Irish, like, like many um, immigrant groups, um, faced a fair, their fair share of, of uh, bigotry and prejudice when they first came over. I, I think what was a little bit surprising to me was the lengths to which um, the white majority, if you will, uh, kind of tried to prevent uh, these various groups of people from buying property um, or from becoming part of the mainstream community. So uh, the story that I was um, told by uh, somebody in Stonington who has done a, a tremendous amount of research on, on the Irish community there and has done talks about it. Um, he discovered that when the, uh, the Irish were trying to establish a church in, um, in Pawcatuck, uh, which is where they were concentrated, the community was concentrated, um, that they had to kind of jump through a lot of hoops in order to get the land and the uh, buildings that they needed to, to build. Uh, that people would not sell to them. And uh, so they had to often uh, kind of uh, get one person to sell and then, and then the, it would be transferred to the church finally. So it was, um, it was kind of a convoluted process uh, just to be able to establish their, their church. Um, it was, uh, and there was a, a kind of a, a fun story um, of just about perseverance, I think, about uh, a Boy Scout troop that was started by a priest at St. Michael, uh, which was the, uh, you know, begun by the Irish community in Pawcatuck. And uh, the priest started a, a Boy Scout troop largely uh, populated by Irish and Italian um, boys. And so they wanted to participate along with all the other Boy Scout troops in uh, one of the parades in uh, Pawcatuck and Westerly. And uh, their application to join the parade kept getting rejected. And the priest uh, kept thought at first that it was some kind of a clerical error and uh, finally re realized what was going on. Um, they were not being accepted because they were Catholic. And so uh, he got all the boys together, um, had them dressed in their uniform, took that picture in front of the church, and then they marched down the street and they joined the parade themselves uh, without any formal permission. And at first, the uh, folks who were running the parade were trying to get them out uh, but there was enough of their supporters there among the crowd that they let them stay. And so I thought that was a, a, nice, uh, a nice story about perseverance and um, maybe some uh, degree of acceptance by the community. Right. And I assume the next year they were in okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> All right. And you also saw, you have some interesting stuff about Native Americans that, you know, often hear about uh, being taken in as indentured servants in the colonial era of uh, Mystic and Stonington. Was that another kind of slavery um, or, or how, how were they treated? Well, it wasn't, it wasn't slavery in the sense that um, because they could, they had a, a set period of time after which they were uh, free to go on their way. Um, but um, while they were indentured servants, certainly the, the conditions weren't very good. And um, they also didn't have the wherewithal to um, negotiate contracts that would allow them to, uh, to get uh, certain things once they were done with their indenture. Uh, so sometimes once the indentures were up, they were kind of tossed out without any money, any clothing, um, any real means of, of, of taking care of themselves. So um, it wasn't, you know, certainly there was a 
there's a big difference between knowing that you have to put up with something for a certain number of years and then you can go your own way and, and those who were enslaved permanently, but um, the conditions certainly were not um, terrific. Yeah, and who indentured them, their parents or how, how did that work? Well, I did find records of uh, in the Connecticut Historical Society that showed that uh, uh, it sometimes was their parents. They, these people were desperately poor uh, for one thing, and they did not have the means to uh, take care of and feed a lot of their children. Uh, and also some of them hoped that they would be able to get their children some kind of job training for the future to be able to support themselves. But um, these uh, business transactions that I found that were uh, about indenturement, uh, you know, were sort of straightforward and there was no emotion there, but you certainly could read between the lines again and, and know of uh, the anguish that um, certainly must have played out behind the scenes. Well, we're talking years, right? They were indentured for oh, like yeah, six, six yeah. years. And, yeah, and well, sometimes they were pretty young children. They might have been eight years old or, or nine years old, and they would be indentured until they were 18, 19, 20 years old. Okay. Um, I think you uh, also in your book sketch a real divide between people who saw themselves as American natives, <laughs> not, not to be confused with Native Americans, but people who thought they'd been here on the Mayflower or, or here long enough to consider themselves natives. Uh, and uh, and recent immigrants uh, during the Industrial Revolution. So why do you think the divide, uh, was it simply suspicion of people with different habits and cultures? Well, um, again, you know, there's, there's no hard evidence uh, saying exactly uh, that I could find. Uh, I'm sure there is somewhere, but that, that I could really find, you know, of people saying, uh, we don't like these people because X, Y, Z. But, um, you know, this was a small town and uh, it was a pretty close community. People didn't travel the way they did, do now. Um, well, nobody's traveling during the pandemic, but, um, you know, people didn't go many places. They didn't, they didn't have computers to be able to see the world through a computer screen. And so when anybody who was different uh, came into town, it was uh, kind of viewed with suspicion. So there was suspicion about a new religion, the Catholics, when the Irish and the Italians first started coming. Um, certainly skin color, which was obvious, was something that stuck out for people. Um, and, uh, and then um, language, you know, language was something. Uh, food, I mean, there was some... Uh, here and there, there were accounts about uh, people talking about how, uh, you know, seeing different foods in, in, um, in markets and thinking, you know, where did this come from? You know, even something as, as Americanized now as like spaghetti, you know, it was kind of like, kind of suspect back then. So uh, that, that was certainly part of it. And then, you know, there was a sort of active um, what I would call hate groups out there, the know-nothings, um, uh, they, they, they actively were anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic. There was the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, the Klan was active in, in Connecticut at one point, uh, or several points, actually. Um, so uh, there were people who, who definitely um, fomented the dissent uh, then as they do now. Right, right. Okay. Um, well, I had a few more questions that I'm going to pass over because we're kind of running out of time, but I didn't want to com uh, sort of complete the interview with uh, the final question, which involves a uh, rather detailed look you had at the placement of Stonington High School that exposed a rift between uh, Pawkatuck, Stonington, and Mystic that apparently still exists today. And I know you were the former chairwoman of the Stonington Board of Education, so you certainly saw some of these things firsthand. Um, but you sort of got into the whole dispute um, and, you know, it was kind of an interesting one that was a little bit more recent uh, that might stir some, uh, some interest today. So tell me a little bit about the high school battles that happened before your time on the board. 
<laughs> yeah, and there's plenty been plenty since then too. Um, so, uh, and you, from your previous question about this division uh, with newer immigrants and kind of uh, older native people who saw themselves as na more natives uh, played out in this high school dispute. So the the high school at one point was uh, what is now the building that is the borough condominiums. Uh, borough school condominiums. So the all the high schoolers were there. Um, but around the 1930s, the school started becoming really crowded. And there was this um, long and uh, very uh, complicated dispute that developed uh, between the town's uh, three major uh, sections, Mystic, Borough, and Pawcatuck. And because Pawcatuck was more, mostly uh, industrial and uh, it had been the place where many of the immigrant groups um, uh, settled, the, um, uh, it also got tied up in this feeling of, of, of us against them in terms of, hey, we can trace our ancestry back in Stonington for, you know, 10 generations and here we're being faced with uh, these sort of Irish and Italian upstarts uh, from Pocketuck who want the school over there. Um, there, it was, uh, it was quite a complex fight and uh, ultimately uh, the high school in the 1930s was uh, built in Pocketuck, uh, what was more recently known as Pocketuck Middle School and um, has since been closed and is the uh, school administration offices. Uh, and then that building was damaged in the 1938 hurricane before it was uh, able to even open. And, uh, and then uh, they let uh, some high schoolers go to the borough and some went to, um, went to Pawcatuck. And then finally they all went to Pawcatuck and by the, by the 1950s, the high school was established at the site where it currently is, um, but some people had been uh, lobbying for that site to be used as early as the mid uh, 1930s. Right, and still a lot of angst over uh, where it got placed, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you, Gail. Um, I'm gonna uh, give it back to Michaela and Belinda to uh, take over from here. I guess we might have a few questions. Well, I think that is all of our questions. Michaela, while you're looking there, I just wanted to mention, um, I did want to give a little bit of a shout out to you know several people who, who helped me, uh, direct me to stories, uh, one of whom was uh, David Erskine, the town's uh, former police chief, uh, who is uh, very interested in local history and and he put me on to several of the stories that I have included in the book. So I wanted to, to mention him. Yeah, go right ahead. Any Thank other you. shout outs? Go right ahead. I was just gonna say, I, if you want, I have a couple more questions that I didn't get to because I wanted to leave enough room for questions at the end. But uh, there's one about the uh, history of the Wadawanek House and its transition to the first women's college in Connecticut, which I think people, a lot of people have never heard of before. They always thought Connecticut College was the first women's college, but uh, that's a pretty interesting history you had in your in your book, Gail, if you want to say a few words. Sure. Actually, um, it's it's pretty appropriate because the Wadawanek House was located right where the Stonington Free Library is now. And uh, it w opened the same time as the, uh, the railroad uh, in 1837. It was um, always planned as a joint venture with the railroad coming in and it served um, travelers there. Um, the, uh, but in the 1850s, it, um, it became a women's college. So it ceased operating as a, as a hotel and it, be, it became a college, uh, which was, kind of, was pretty interesting because uh, Connecticut College is, uh, here's a picture of, of the hotel. Um, 
Connecticut College is is kind of known as the uh, one of the first uh, uh, you know, higher education uh, establishments for women in the state. Um, but this was operated as a college. It had about 160 students. Um, it uh, operated for only five years. It closed just before the Civil War in um, 1862. And uh, one, it was, uh, it had a, a combination of uh, day students who were local and uh, uh, students who came to and boarded there um, from outside of the area. Um, it was pretty much for uh, wealthy women, um, but it had a, a kind of full academic program. And um, uh, some of the uh, stories that I found about it uh, uh, really, ta uh, really were illustrative of um, the uh, uh, kind of uh, social attitudes of the day, including racist attitudes. So uh, it it was one of the uh, one of the uh, few places where I did find kind of chronicle of kind of active uh, racism there, um, which uh, which was sort of interesting. And, um, uh, but it, it, there wasn't clear why it went out of business. Uh, it could have been the Civil War. It could have been something else. Um, there was some flip um, uh, reference in one of the uh, sources I saw that said something about maybe the, the beautiful young ladies got sick of all the, the Stonington boys uh, running after them. Um, but for whatever reason, it closed in 1862 and the Wadawanek Hotel uh, became a hotel again until uh, the 1890s when it was uh, then uh, uh, demolished to make way for the library. All right, I guess we can leave it at that unless you wanted to get into the Mystic Peace meetings. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was actually hoping that you would uh, ask okay. me a question about the Mystic Peace meetings because there's, uh, there's something really interesting that I wanted to mention about that. Go for it. Okay, so on the, the land that later became Camp Mystic, Mary Job Akeley's camp, uh, for many years uh, between the 1860s and uh, around 1900 roughly, uh, they were the site of these really large gatherings uh, of peace activists, some some years as uh, many as 10,000 people would come to these uh, outdoor meetings. Uh, they uh, would set up camp there and it became like a, a show. Um, there was vendors there, food vendors, and then there it kind of, you know, there was, it attracted like carnival acts and, and uh, that kind of thing. Um, so it became a kind of just a spectacle as much as um, uh, a, talking about peace, uh, but certainly it grew out of the uh, backlash to the horrors of the Civil War. Uh, but one of the mo most interesting things that I found out uh, in researching that part of the book was that some of the um, uh, speakers at this annual peace conference were quite well known, uh, such as William Lloyd Garrison, and uh, one woman named uh, Belva Lockwood, who actually uh, ran for president of the US uh, decades before there was universal woman suffrage in the United States. And the, the kind of funny but sad story about Belva Lockwood was that she experienced a lot of backlash from men um, including that they would, uh, all uh, men would come a uh, group together and have what they called Mother Hubbard parades, uh, making fun of Belva Lockwood and her um, uh, candidacy for president and uh, the desire to give women the vote. And so all these men would parade, would dress up in their wives or sisters' clothing, and they'd carry brooms and uh, rolling pins and all kinds of, of things like that. And they'd parade through the town. And there was uh, recorded uh, uh, stories in the local press 
of, of these parades in both Mystic and Stonington uh, in different years. Uh, so uh, it was absurd and, um, and sarcastic and uh, meant to, I guess, be funny. Um, but it was uh, kind of uh, kind of sad too. Oh, and I do see. Uh, yeah, thanks, Libby. Libby uh, Friedman there is saying that there is a figurehead of her at the Mystic Seaport. That's right, uh, there is. So, so Belva Lockwood was somebody that I was introduced to uh, through my research about the Mystic Peace meetings, and uh, she was um, a pretty brave and, and astounding character. Great, thanks, Gail. Um, uh, I did write a story about Gail's book, so you can find that online. Uh, also, I do a recorded history podcast in which I interviewed Gail uh, for her first book. Um, unfortunately, the COVID kind of uh, messed up our scheduled uh, interview on this book, but I'm glad we could, we could do it here at the library. So thank you guys for hosting it, and uh, I will turn it back to Michaela and Belinda. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Gail, and we, we, we really, really appreciate it. And I just wanted to point out, I hope everyone saw in the chat, I did put the registration link uh, to Tom's program, so you can register. It'll be Thursday, October 15th at 5 via Zoom, and he'll be talking about uh, the Green Book. So any final words from you, Belinda? No, just to say thank you so much, Gail, and thank you, Lee, and... Um, that was the most wonderful conversation. It really was so engaging. Thank you for doing this. It's really a wonderful gift to the library and the community. So we'll see you again soon, right? <laughs> Anytime. We'll see you in a month. Yes. <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great night. Yes. Good night, everybody. Cheers. <laughs> Bye.